Okay, welcome to the final presentation day of uh, the 2024 OCE Hackathon. Uh, great to have all of you joining us. I know a lot, a lot of work has been done this week. I know many of you uh, either got up early or stayed up late uh, last night. Um, so thank you for all the effort and all the work, but we are really looking forward to what you have to show us today. So I'm going to start by uh, uh, having Lars present and uh, we will go from there. Um, really, it's a going to be a volunteer order. I'm not sure who's presenting for each of your teams. So um, you'll, uh, once Lars is gone, we'll need someone to raise their hand and uh, start their presentation. So um, Lars, uh, let me start with prayer and then we will we will get going. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you um, for this hackathon. Thank you for these men and women who uh, want to uh, use their skills for your glory. I pray that you would be glorified by uh, the creativity, um, the hard work, uh, the um, ideas that are uh, demonstrated here today, and that that would be uh, honoring and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Lars. I hope my uh, audio is okay. I haven't had much time to test. Good. My, good. Colleague, my colleagues are next door here. I had to arrange things uh, on my computer here for this presentation, so I might come over there to join them later, but for now I will present from here. And so uh, I would have liked, I think maybe most of you or many of you would have been a little bit further, but uh, what is not working is that I cannot play audio. <coughs> you have audio basically available, but it didn't make it. And also some of the looks doesn't look as nice as I would have liked to, but the function is there. And so I will try to start screen sharing now. So I just have to find the right one. Here I think. So I will start with the Bible navigation. And so what I did here is I got code from other projects I've been working with, and I tried to make this more sensible in our situation. And so I have a scripture navigation by pictures. I do have some titles for different uh, big categories. So I start with having 10 categories. So this is chronological Genesis, Exodus, and then you go chronologically through the Bible. Uh, the yeah, um, yeah. So um, the exile gospels, acts, and epistles, including Revelation. So let's go just at the beginning, Genesis. Maybe we'll look at Noah. And now I should be able to listen to this. I do have the full audio Bible but uh, I didn't get it to work. But just imagine that this would come up with an audio player at the bottom, and it should then remember where I was last time, and I could, should be able to get back there, but this doesn't work. But at least you can see the idea, and I can then go back. And also, it would have been nice to use swipe on a mobile phone and so on. All these things I didn't have time to uh, include. But you can see the basic idea that you can navigate all over the Bible by pictures, and I can go wherever I want to go. Uh, look at the birth of Sam Solomon, uh, the death of David, and yeah, yeah, this is especially for oral people who don't know how to read. By navigating with pictures, they can go anywhere and listen. I did, however, manage to get video working. So video will come up a little bit different, but uh, it's still very nice. So I did get video for Gospel of John. So this is from another project. So 
here, you can see this is the Gospel of John and the full Gospel of John as episodes in a series. So let's say I want to uh, look at, what should I look at? The way, truth, and life. If I, well, I could actually try this, let me see. I don't know if you hear, but it it, it is playing and uh, I hear the sound myself at least. There are many rooms in my father. I, I think that's enough. But uh, if I, I'm going to prepare a place. If I switch to orientation of the mobile, I would have a full screen on the mobile playing the video and it would stop after this episode. So that's working. And that's the end of the Bible navigation, but I would have liked to, together with Abel, also integrate, which didn't happen, but I hope sometime in the future we can do this with some app and have the OBS. So that's the final part of my presentation. So I did the same with the OBS. So I had the chronological here as well. And uh, what should we look at? Let's look at uh, so here are all the stories in Exodus and the 10 plagues. I have all the pictures of the 10 plagues coming up here. And this could, of course, could have been with audio, being able to jump to any part of the 10 plagues, listen to it. And uh, yeah, that's the idea. And there was quite a time spent trying to find out what picture goes to what title and such things. So I had to do a little bit of such things just to organize OBS in a hierarchical way. So that's my end of presentation, unless there are some questions briefly. If not. Any questions for Lars? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I do have a quick question, Lars. Uh, was it just, was it time as far as the audio playing or were there challenges that you couldn't overcome? No, just time. Uh, I had to focus on the OBS and uh, uh, leave the other thing. Uh, exciting because of time, because the Iranian people who came here and others came to visit, there were some synergy happening, which uh, mm. took away some time. So I had to cut a few things out. Yeah, that sounds like a very, very valuable uh, use of your time, though. So yeah, it was <laughs> great. Yeah, and it was a pleasure to have a French here in Switzerland too. So uh, you will hear from them later. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, Mark, uh, would you like to go now or? Yeah. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Yes. Yes, I can see it. It's working. Okay. So yeah, this week um, we did uh, just linear for alignment and just linear by AI. Um, and by we, I mean the French team in Switzerland uh, teaming up with Joshua. <coughs> Josh was in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. It, it was, it was, it was like he was here. Wow, <laughs> Ma magical feature, last comment. So, in the French team, we are uh, basing our translation work on a thing called juxtalinear, kind of a French speciality. Uh, yeah, that was um, invented in 19th century by a world famous French editor called Hachette. It was, in fact, a method to help children, seven, eight years old, to learn ancient Greek and Latin. So the, the main idea was to take a classical text, to cut it into chunks of two, three or four words, Latin or Greek words, and to reorganize them in order to fit the natural order of the world, of the words, of the um, um, target language. So we applied this method to the biblical text. So here you have the letter 
of Paul to Philippians. You can see the first verses with on the right, on the left column, uh, Greek chunks reorganized to fit the, the natural way of speaking of a French native speaker. So for one Greek word on the left side, you have one French word on the right side. Each time you have to translate one Greek word by two or more French words, they are linked by a dash. And each time you have to add extra words in French that are not necessary in Greek, you put them in italics. So, so this method uh, allows the user, the final translator, for example, to have a mirror-like access to the original language without knowing one word or one grammatical rule of it. Well, um, okay. yeah. that was you too. Yeah. yeah, so our idea is to base our alignment work not on um, the Greek text uh, word to word, but on the chunks of the juxtalinear. It would help the final translator to have uh, easier access uh, to the original language and to align more easily, far more easily. And for the example here, we have taken a standard English version. And in red, you can see uh, a servant of God in the English translation is linked, is aligned to one chunk on the left side, servant of God, which translates two words in Greek. That's the basic uh, theoretical idea. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Right. So on the AI side, this is jo Joshua was going to explain the how. Um, um, I'd like to explain the why because we suggested he looked at this. Uh, essentially, to make a juxtalinear, there are levels. So you start with the original Greek. In this case, we're using the UGNT from Unfolding Word, which has Greek morphology. And so the, low, the lowest hanging fruit was what's at the bottom. So we, we give to the AI the UGNT with the morphology that's there, and we give it the juxtalinear, which has got the reorganized Greek and also the French. And with that, we're trying to produce, for example, a juxtalinear in English. And if that works, which, well, if that works, I won't spoil the punchline here, um, that potentially gives us the option to have an English juxta, a Russian juxta, a Spanish juxta, uh, potentially a Farsi juxta, all based off the manual work done in French. So we still need to do it once, but only in one language. Next row up um, is trying to produce the French gloss. So that means that someone still needs to manually do the left-hand side in Greek, which is pretty stable between languages. The AI, without looking at French, can then produce the French or potentially the English or potentially something else. And what that does for us is it gives us the right hand column of our French work for free. And then once we've got that, we can do everything below. We can also do it in English, Spanish, Russian and Farsi. The top level is going is saying, what about if we let the AI do the left hand column too? So we give it the original Greek. We say, chunk this up like you would in the juxta. We organize all the words, put them into separate bits. And if you've got that, then basically that's all juxta for free. So in other words, basically we could press a button and in a week we'd have juxta for the entire world. And as we've been saying here, we would have turned Con uh, Quentin into a robot. So those are like the three options there. Um, yeah, increasing potential and increasing difficulty. And from there we go to... Yeah, so what we've done uh, this week for alignment, uh, we started with a brainstorming based on what the user uh, would do on the on the app. Um, so just to get ideas about uh, what the interface could be, uh, based on that, we did a prototype. Uh, and then it just iterated uh, with user tests and improvements. Cool. So the way to present that to the user would be like, uh, would be an integration into Scribe. So we've used uh, the uh, our knowledge uh, in uh, Scribe code to implement that inside this. So now what you are seeing on the screen now uh, is uh, 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 the prototype of what we uh, aim to do in Scribe and I can showcase it after, but it's working quite well and uh, we've already used it and uh, 
Yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, integrated in Scribe right now. Okay, no. So uh, live demo. So can I suggest a live demo? Can I suggest first of all we cut to Joshua because our live demo relies on some of the work that he did. So if we stop sharing our screen and Joshua, you start sharing your screen and your ten minutes starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and so I'll start the screen sharing and see that would be this desktop. All right and. Hopefully, all the right stuff shows up. Okay, I this showed up on the wrong screen. Okay, there we go. Um, except now it disappeared again. Ah! I have a black screen, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, let's see if... Okay. Trying to figure out how to get the black screen to go away. You may need to start stop sharing and start sharing again. Okay, I stopped sharing. Now my window showed back up. Now I'll start sh sharing again. Okay, I think you can see it now. Correct. Yeah. Oh. I can see drag and drop file here. I've got a black bar in the way, but it's probably the zoom toolbar. Okay. Well, let's, let's just proceed. Yeah. All right. All right. So these are the inputs to the automatic glossing tool. So, um, you tell it what language, let's see, tell it what the name of the book is, uh, what the language you want to uh, translate to. So we could say Spanish or, um, Russian, whatever we want. And then we have to drop the juxtalinear that has the chunked verses in right here. And then if you're translating into French, you need to exclude the, the gloss from the chunk that you put in because you don't want to say, here's French, please translate it into French. Otherwise it will cheat. Um, and here we can give it any extra props to ChatGPT. So if you see it's doing something you don't want it to, you can give it some instructions to do otherwise. Um, so we were trying to translate into Farsi and it was using Arabic words. So right here, you can drop a UFS X of, which is the translation in that particular language so that it will then feed in the verses for each target uh, so that it will use, uh, words from a translation when it's producing the juxtalinear and then down here, you say what model from chat GPT you want to run, you fire it off, and then it will give you a download button. Uh, here's what uh, gets fed in as a prompt. Um, it says, look at this first, and it gives it the Greek uh, for that sentence. And then right here, it gives the Farsi target verse. So that would be Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. And then it says, please focus on these specific words. And those, so that's the chunk. Then it gives the morphology information for that chunk. And then it says, the gloss for this in French is, and it gives that. And then it says, what's the gloss for this in Farsi? Um, and gives the uh, request for asterizing things and ask for it to be output in JSON. And so then here's the specific output from that specific request. And then we compile that into results. So here is the Farsi output. This hasn't been checked <laughs> by someone who speaks the language yet, but I was able to show that if I copied words from this, I could find it in the actual translation that we were pulling stuff from. So that seems like that's a good indication that it's at least using semi-appropriate words. Uh, so the next thing uh, we accomplished was getting auto chunking working. Uh, so um, with that, we took the resource from Clear Bible, uh, where they had a syntax tree for the Greek, and um, we basically go from the leaves up, uh, travel up the tree until you have about three leaves below you, and take a snip from there. 
and uh, there's a little bit more complication to that, but then we get this auto chunking and let's see, I'm not, let's see, is this the auto chunked one or not? Yes, this is first Peter. So we have the entire New Testament chunked. <laughs> and so we can throw all of that at chat GPT to get a glossing for everything. And then the French uh, output wasn't a hundred percent. Um, like every fourth verse, uh, every fourth chunk or so, there was a correction that needed to happen. So some will have to go over manually. Um, but we got auto chunking at least. Uh, hopefully that's uh, helpful. And then one last thing that I did is I made it so that there were, I used ChatGB to do sub chunk alignment. So you can see here, Apollos is blue here, it's blue there, green there, green there. And if you hover over it, you can see what ChatGPT said in order to make that correlation. So that way, if something's weird, we can see whether or not I just parsed the output of ChatGPT incorrectly or what's going on. <laughs> so let's see. Yep, and that's the end of that demo. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to stop sharing and it's back to Mark and his team. So Joshua, on that chart uh, that Mark just showed us the kind of going up in difficulty, um, which of those did you did you attempt all of those stages? Um, well, uh, how about we go back to his? Go back to Mark. Sure. Yeah, and then Mark can... screen, and then yeah. we can look at that page and uh, answer that question. Okay, we can do that. So if you want to share your screen again, Leo, uh, with the demonstration and go back to the slide with the um, Lost in Space robot, which I insisted we had because he's my favorite robot from when I watched Black and White TV okay. half a century ago. I was um, curious about that myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah, Google it. Yeah, Lost in Space. Great, great series. Um, that was going to be the future. So, yeah, that's the thing. So off you go, uh, Joshua. Okay, so let's see. Or original Greek more fault. Um, actually, Mark, do you mind, since you're familiar with this screen, how about you grade what I've done this week and tell yeah. everyone what I've accomplished? Yeah, I actually have that on another slide. So uh, oh, okay. let's, let's just we go to Nicola to demonstrate the scribe, and then I'll, I'll come to my conclusions at the end, and then we can talk about it. Does that work? Sounds great. Over to you, Nicola. Yep. So <laughs> stop sharing. And I can share my screen. Like this. Does everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. So <clears throat> this is our implementation in Scribe. So this is the juxtalinear part where our uh, linguists can uh, modify the text and all this stuff. And so uh, I can modify my uh, my text here, add uh, some some text here, and um, it goes. Uh, uh, um, a sentence by sentences uh, for the modification of this. So this is Titus, uh, the, all the work have been done. So uh, I won't modify anything, but uh, you can modify the chunks here <clears throat> by uh, dragging and dropping uh, where, do, uh, do you want the, where do you want the words to be. And <clears throat> at the end for the alignment of the juxtalinear, I will hand over that to Gabriel, <clears throat> who will present the, uh, our implementation into Scribe of the what we are doing it right now, we can switch to the yes, we can switch to the alignment part where we can uh, right away align directly what we've done in the juxtalinear. Yeah, so this is the interface we've came up with. Uh, so there is a little tutorial for new be beginners to align. Uh, so you select a chunk here. The first one is already selected. You select a word to align to, and you go to the next chunk. Uh, if there is multiple word, we can mouse over, and it will select uh, everything. Um, you can go to the next. If you want to know which chunk you align with each other, you just have to over it. And um, that's the basic implementation. Um, in this version, there is some things that it's not yet um, imported in Scribe, like the fact you can um, uh, change the font family 
uh, of the text and uh, zoom each column uh, of text independently. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. For the demo, yeah. And USFM. Ah, uh, yeah. And then the USFM, yeah. And either way. So <clears throat> uh, the actual goal of this uh, of this week was also to produce a, a USFM compatible. Uh, um, what's the uh, with uh, with T-Core. So <clears throat> we are we have produced from what you've seen on the screen on Scribe. We've produced a USFM aligned uh, with the standard of uh, unfolding words. But we are literally two hours from having the last latest la last version and uh, and uh, the well formatted extra So this is the the first shot, and um, so we you can see that we have the occurrences extra extra, and we are yeah literally two hours from having the fin final USFM. So here is the first result. It was just for uh, like uh, uh, it, it, we have good uh, good. Exp uh, Good uh, expectations, hope. good yeah. hopes that we'll have this US uh, in a in a wow. few hours. So, thank you. Yeah, conclusion. Okay, thank you. So, if we can have the PowerPoint back, please. Yes. Oh, it's not PowerPoint. I think we <coughs> put it PowerPoint. We would have it if we right. presenting that. Okay, if we can go on. Right. So, conclusions. The alignment bit in Scribe works by our definition of working. Like I say, we need to do the last bit to actually export it, but that seems to work. Seems very efficient. If no one else uses it, our team is going to use it in <coughs> June to align the French gateway language translation we're doing for um, the Bible Aquifer. And like I say, it basically does what we wanted to do. We'd love to have comments on how useful this is to anyone else. On the work that uh, Joshua's done, I mean, first of all, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we, we kind of had a spec and it, an idea to do and that took about 20 minutes so we had to think of more things so yeah amazing work on a technical level um if you take if you start with the low-hanging fruit um the option where we basically produce a juxtalinea in french and use that to produce juxtalineas for everyone else that was that seems certainly looking at english um amazingly promising i mean it's not perfect but frankly it's as good as the first attempts of some gifted second year greek students we've tried i mean it's really promising we still yeah. need cleaning up, but will take significantly less time than starting from scratch. So, I mean, we will be using that. That's that's absolutely clear. For the two others, um, the producing French, I mean, we had some teething problems with that. Um, every attempt was a lot better than the last one. Not quite there yet, but again, impressive. And that's, um, and I say that would give us the French column of the French Jukes still in the air. And the bottom option, which would give us basically the whole thing, um, that was frankly better than expected. Joshua said, well, shall I try this? And it's like, well, why not? But I really can't see this. Um, I say, not, not, I would say it's like 80% there, um, but a lot better than we expected. And if, and if we got that whole stack working, then like I say, we could do Jukes still in the air for the world by Tuesday or something, okay? <laughs> the, the big question with this is, for us, is does it actually save time? So if you take the one particularly on the bottom, where we're trying to reorganize the Greek, um, I say a lot of it is right. Some of it needs modification, but there are two things. One is it kind of needs to be 100% right because we're going right back to the Greek and it's like mm -hmm. if it's wrong one time in 50, that's a gateway language, then into minority, then into French, then into another language from French. It's like, if you get it a bit wrong there, it's, this can go seriously wrong by the end thing. And mm -hmm. what, Cont what Contan tells me is basically to check it, I'd have to do all the work I do anyway. Mm -hmm. But why don't I just do all the work anyway? So, I mean, we, we need to do the test, basically. We need to actually try um, getting Contan and Yance, our people who normally do this, to do it the normal way, do it starting from what Josh's code produces and see what that's like and so on. That will be our question about it, but no doubt, I, I, would, I would say particularly the top level thing, um, for me, it's the first time I've seen AI doing something in, for us as in our team, where I can really see it saving time. And I think mm. that's largely because the juice linear is an almost mathematical kind of thing. You're not looking for a great flowing thing. It's almost word for word mathematical. Um, anyway, had a great time. Thanks to Lars for hosting us and thanks to Joshua for fitting in with us from another continent. Um, any questions? Thank you. Any questions?
No questions. Just this is marvelous. This is a great work, guys. Yeah, it is great work. I do have a question, Mark. Um, do you see a pathway, a clear path toward um, predictions in like what um, Gabrielle was showing in Scribe? It just seemed like um, it would be pretty powerful for the user to be able to see what what the computer was predicting would be aligned. Um, do you see any path for that? I mean, we didn't look at that, but yes, I mean, so uh, I think Wednesday we demonstrated this in French and everyone was like, we can't tell the difference. So this time we deliberately took the Berean Standard Bible, which has nothing to do with the Jukes Linear, but like you saw, it's still remarkably similar. So, I mean, yes. it kind of seems to me like you could almost run an AI in the screen and say, try and align it first and then try and fix it. I mean, we didn't do any work, didn't talk about it, but I agree, looking at that on the screen, you kind of think this has to be a relatively easy problem to match up two almost identical chunks of things in the same language. I mean, it, it has to be worth trying. Yeah, okay, great. That is really good work, you guys. Um, definitely uh, exciting to see and I can, I have all kinds of questions I want to talk to Mark about offline um, on this uh, after seeing it in action. So really, really good. Spurs all kinds of ideas. Okay, now uh, we are past our, our initially scheduled presentation. So now somebody has to actually volunteer. Um, who's ready to go to go next? Just uh, click the speak up or click the raise your hand. Daniel, you want to jump in here? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so I teamed up with Elsie this week and we started looking into Codium AI. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, I can see OC. Okay, good. Demolition okay, squad. Okay, so, yeah, we, we came, it took a little bit to um, figure out a name, but we finally got one. <laughs> okay, so our objectives for this week that we wanted to explore was an AI-powered platform, just because we, as testers, we always think about it being more on the development side and not so much as the testing side. So we just wanted to kind of, figure out everything that um, we could learn about it. So and then we wanted to gain a better understanding how AI supplements the test writing process. And then we wanted to actually set up an isolated instance and have an AI generate a, a working test. And so the overall, um, the overview of Codium AI, there's a lot of features in it, but we kind of just kind of look more towards the testing side of the features. And so we um, looked at how it can improve code quality to generate and complete accurate test cases at the component level to increase productivity, automate the process of the writing test suites, to reduce bug risk, and it could help catch bugs earlier in development so it's not during runtime. And then just explaining the code to provide insights into code structure, logic, and the intent, just because getting code for the very first time looking at it, you don't really know all about it. So it's kind of good, helpful insight to it. I put down the um, website of Codium AI. And then right here, I um, did a video. So um, for the it integrated into the VS code. So if you go down, right click on the function, go down to Codium AI, then generate test. On the right side, the um, AI will pop up. In test suites, you can see the behavioral coverage where it has the happy path, edge cases, and other. And it looks like it's still loading. It's calculus. But it will actually say that you can generate tests for each individual thing. And as you can see, it's like right here, it's generate test. And then right there, I already generated some tests. So you click on that and it just automatically pops up new tests. So 
that was really cool to learn. Oh, went too far. Okay. And then now, um, right next to the test suite, you can see the code explanation. So you can see where it has the summary, the example usage, and then if you scroll down more on the screen, you can see the picture that I did where it um, has the code analysis, the inputs, and the flow for the function. And then over on the toolbar, there's like a little icon for the Codium, and it's it has a chat window, so it'll kind of help improve or your understanding or to test your code. So for the results that we had for the week is we successfully installed Codium AI extension into the VS code, which is actually called Codium 8, and integrated the Codium 8 into the project that only contained a few tests. So we just wanted to see that it gen actually generated tests without having a big test suite. Codium 8 generated new tests for the test suite within the parameters that were set. And we kind of had a little bit of a challenge for the configuration, or at least I did um, when I was setting up just because each project is different for the um, dependencies and stuff. So, but it was actually really cool to learn and explore of Codium AI. And uh, pretty, um, we're pretty excited to kind of use some of this stuff as a new tool for our toolbox. And I think this will conclude our presentation, unless Elsie wants to jump in to add something if I forgot something. But. I think you covered everything, Daniel. I just want to add the reason we add, named our team Demolition Squad is that uh, as developers, you build stuff up and we tear it down. <laughs> and with this AI function, we are able to tear down function by function, write test function by function. So um, it's a good tool and um, really excited to use it. That's all. Any questions from you guys? I think you're supposed to say you help them build it even better um, is the, the, yeah. the nice way to say that. Yeah, early fail test. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Um, great to see you exploring like that and um, getting this going and really trying it out uh, quite thoroughly. Um, I think uh, the other thing we learned is that I should have Daniel uh, do all my pre format, all my presentations um, from now on. That was a really okay. nice presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, Alexander, what do you have for us? Yes, it's me. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wish you all good presentations and go, good mood. Uh, we had uh, two directions uh, and two teams, uh, and uh, they uh, entrust me uh, to present uh, with all the work with, with what we uh, managed uh, to do these days. Okay. What we have, I want to share my screen. <clears throat> Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, what we have, we have uh, mm, uh, the first uh, team uh, is uh, Titan. Uh, they was uh, dealing with the problem uh, of uh, of the community check we wanted to uh, create a api uh, and a site that we can uh, create some checks and uh, send links uh, someone to who want to check this we have uh, for now it's just site that used uh, in some methods and what we have, we can uh, go to project. It's uh -huh. uh, we have project. You can create. You or use uh, something existing. We have uh, books. Uh, you uh, can create or use existing. Uh, and uh, we have uh, checks. A list of checks. 
uh, and then we can create some check uh, that we have uh, we have um, we can uh, uh, create new name uh, and uh, provide the link uh, I think. Mm -hmm. well, you've muted uh, okay yes okay. Uh, sorry uh, we have uh, expiration date uh, that we uh, okay I think I can put it down uh, that we will check uh, uh, community check it uh, it will be gone or it will be uh, finished uh we save it uh and uh, we uh have link and this link uh, we can um, uh, drop somebody in a message uh, in, uh, in telegram whatsapp and there and uh, there was a uh, uh, book that we uh, want to uh, community check and uh, in this case uh, uh, they uh, maybe can text uh, save this and maybe that's all uh, then we have uh, we uh, need to wait when uh, this check is uh, it will be finished you have finished uh, and uh, we can uh, download these notes in tsv format like this uh, and we what we make uh, made uh, we made uh, <clears throat> I think it it's uh, this okay. We made uh, um, functionality for create token. Uh, it's just generate token uh, to um, for access to this uh, API. Uh, maybe that's all in this case. And you, uh, if you have any question, you you can ask. If you're not, uh, uh, so Alexander, I, um, yes. do you expect uh, each would it, would this be used by each person in the community, or would it be a a, a, a per, one person doing a community check with with many uh, many people? Uh, we plan it uh, to uh, use uh, mm, uh, one one. Uh, mm, uh, checking it's it's uh, for uh, many people and okay. uh, 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 and um, uh, else uh, uh, checking uh, personal checking okay. just for adding some uh, ID for this uh, it, it's uh, it will be uh, for just uh, this person and we um, uh, ex expect yes expect uh, for uh, from this uh, person uh just uh, uh his uh, or her uh, uh notes okay. two cases a community uh for everyone and personal for um, with id okay great uh okay uh let's Jesse, go Jesse next has, okay. hang on yes? i just a question one one yes, quick yes. question so is that token so that another app can integrate with this? Uh, yes, uh, I think yes. Uh, okay. It's we 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 working uh, in these uh, days for uh, for these uh, 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 tokens, and uh, I think it, it it will be helpful for integrate it uh, for something other of, uh, application. In details, uh, you can uh, ask in in uh, Discord because uh, uh, we we have split it uh, in different uh, cases and uh, maybe some details uh, team can explain you in uh, Discord. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and the uh, uh, next uh, case, uh, mm, the second team uh, studied and created uh, some audio uh, components. Uh, uh, in general, we took uh, the Wave Surfer library as a basis. Uh, and we had uh, amb ambitious uh, plans. We wanted to record audio uh, so that we could uh, edit something during recording. Uh, uh, we have not achieved this goal, not yet. Uh, and uh, so far, we just made uh, separate play uh, playback, uh, editing, and recording functionality. In, uh, <clears throat> in first, is just... Uh, uh, just a uh, player uh, second uh, it's uh, just recording uh, for we, we can pause stop uh, and maybe say uh, the next uh, we have editor uh, we can upload something we can play we can copy just uh, copy and uh, we can uh, uh, copy it chunk uh, insert maybe maybe another place and we can maybe cut mm, just cut okay uh, what we have uh, else we have uh, transcribe uh, it's uh, I I think I need to uh -huh. reload for this. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's uh, transcribe. Uh, in this example, we uh, start recording audio, and uh, uh, English language model is configured now. It's uh, it's just uh, hard code. Uh, will uh, we speak? Uh, mm, uh, it uh, recognizes the text. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we press stop, uh, and now every word is a timestamp. By clicking on the word, uh, we go to the right moment in the audio. Uh, the words may be gray. Uh, it's uh, which it means that uh, the accuracy uh, factor is uh, mm, below. 70 uh, person. Uh, we also want to implement uh, the following functions, uh, recognition of already recorded audio, uh, full uh, synchronization with text, uh, reviewing uh, listening text, uh, the ability to edit recognized uh, text, exporting text to M M P3 three while metadata uh, and choosing the recognition recognition language. Uh, okay, and the last uh, one it's uh, it's audio markup. How it work? Okay, oh, we can play uh, and uh, uh, we can maybe uh, add a bookmark maybe one maybe two and uh, we have uh, functionality to get this but it's uh, not for safe now uh, not saving but uh, we uh, researching for how to add uh, bookmarks with something uh, <clears throat> text in in the audio uh, i think that's all any question Any questions for Alexander? Yes, I do have one uh, kind of technical question, but uh, uh, is your React component like usable out of the box like this, like your audio markup? Uh, audio markup, uh, it's, uh, um, we use a uh, 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 wave server uh, library for this. Uh, and we uh, just use uh, some plugins uh, uh, for this library, uh, for for this component, 
uh, it's uh, yes it's it's a react uh, component uh, and now it work oh, like like this just uh, just that no not just for for save we we need to some refactoring some adding some new uh, functions okay yeah. okay so but i mean this is great work so when this is finished the idea is that we could take this component and use it inscribe or use it for somewhere else is that the idea it's a portable component mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it's it's uh, uh, open components ecosystem. Okay, okay. That, that was my only question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this is excellent work. Um, I think you, we should have partnered our our team, um, the team AI, don't know uh, should have partnered with you this week uh, as well. Um, this is this is really beautiful, uh, really exciting. Mm -hmm. Great to have those pieces as uh, components for other developers to use. So really, really good. And since there was a lot of audio in the A, I don't know, uh, and I don't see any other hands raised, I think I'm going to volunteer them to go next. Oh, now I have two other hands. Do you want to go uh, A, I don't know? Or do you want some more time? What's that, Spider? Can you hear me? Yep, I, I'm starting to. The volume's coming up. Okay, let's see if I can share. All right, so you should see two windows. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to share. Uh, what our intention was, what we had hoped to do was to be able to navigate the, the open Bible stories by voice. So uh, we envisioned a uh, press to talk button. And so you see in the console there uh, that yes, we're talking now. And then you release it to stop. And so that piece kind of works. And then having recorded some information, we'd like to use AI to um, extract a request out of it and then uh, use that to load up a uh, open Bible story frame you know, one one paragraph out of an open Bible study and play it like this. And so, um, anyway, it does play, but that's, we have all the pieces and we could not string them all together um, this time. So we're going to go through our group and say which part each worked on and show any successes that we did that we were largely successful, except for the final integration of getting audio out. Uh, other than that, it worked fairly well. So we're going to start with um, McLean. I'm McLean. Yeah, Mr. McLean is going to begin. So you know, one of the pet challenges I took the piece of doing the audio recording and or transcribe, transcribing. And one of the challenges I ran into is that VS Code has actually locked down, um, has locked down the microphone and the camera by default in VS Code because they consider it a security problem to be able to, and an annoyance. So, so I had, but I tested that out by trying several different examples of using like the audio, uh, the media device API within a web view UI component. And then I tried to, then I started looking when I kept getting the request or from the request for the microphone access, when I kept getting it coming back, access denied, I started digging in and uh, 
discovered every a lot of other people are running into the same problem. So then also we started looking at, okay, there's a lot of VS Code extensions out there. Um, surely one of them will work. And unfortunately, every single VS Code extension, you look at it and you read, there's a very, there's a, a disclaimer on it that it will only work for certain things where it will capture and put it in as a command or put it into an edit field. Like if you have an open file, it will capture the text into that. And so that, that was very disconcerting. And many of the examples did not have the VS Code extensions did not have, were not open source, so we couldn't look at it. But fortunately, you know, Birch, who is the search meister, was able to find a VS Code extension that was open source and that we could look at and see how they do that. And so what we discovered is that almost everybody that's recording audio is shelling out to use an external command. Uh, either they're opening a browser, they can use the, they can use the uh, media AIs within it, or they're shelling out to Python, running, running the script within Python to capture audio or Java, or they're doing, or they're calling uh, a native application that's on that, on the specific operating system. So, you know, so at this point, we just kind of pivoted, okay, to get, just to get the demo going after a couple of days of writing the dead ends, um, I took the example that Birch found, copied the code over into, you know, into our app that's demoing. Because of course, you know, we couldn't do it as just a regular app. We had to do it within VS Code, you know, as VS Code extension. What, what could go wrong there? And so this example actually will open up, um, will open up in an external browser, uh, a web page. And then from there, from that web, in that web page, it, you'll get the request, can we use the mic? You'll do that. It is all, and that once you do that, it is now capturing audio. Um, using uh, the speech API. So we're actually using the API in the browser to convert the audio into text. And then once it's converted, uh, we're using a web socket to send it back to, send it back to our VS Code extension and passes it off to the next person who's working in identifying the commands that are in there. So I guess, we go to Chris at this point to talk to you or do you reach first? He said to do my letter. Huh? Oh, you want to do the last part next? Yeah, I'll do the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Rich. Rich, um, we need to make sure we speed this up a little bit. We're running, we're running late on, on our time. Do you want me to go or okay. go ahead, just, but yeah, just don't show what we were talking about. Yeah. You can show it, but yeah, just do it quickly. Yeah, I'll show it. Um, let me show my screen. Can you guys see that screen? Yep. All right. This is just a really quick overview of how the LLM function works. And so there's a commands.json file, which is basically just a list of commands that VS Code that we created that VS Code can understand, creates an embeddings of it, stores it in the vector database. Um, whenever a user has a command, we also create an embedding for that and then compare it to the existing embeddings, get a matching te text chunk from that, send that um, prompt and the text chunk off to chat GPT, which ends up giving us a matched command. And so in action, what that looks like is, um, let's say I want to play OBS story 17, frame 10. Right now it's just connected to like a simple Python Flask API. That API will return some kind of um, object that has the command, which is the OBS, um, give us the 
frame number and then the story number. Um, behind the scenes, that's taking, so here's a query that the user input on to play OBS story 17 frame 10. Um, we're gonna tell ChatGPT, hey, the user said, I want to play story 17 frame 10. Use this context, use this context, which I got from the Dispect database to answer that question. Within that context is just a simple play story, story number, frame, frame number. And so we're giving it the exact thing it needs to answer the question, um, give it a prompt, and then by the end it should return from the commands, play stories in the frame 10. And so putting that all together with the, we're gonna have audio. Play story 17 frame 10. We couldn't get the audio to play, but we could get it to display the URL of the chunk of the text. And so theoretically, I don't know if you guys can hear my audio, but it's playing mm. story 17 frame 10 from the OBS. Theoretically, this wouldn't actually display a URL that would actually put the audio. But so yeah, that's all of it working together. So I'll stop sharing my. And Rich? Okay. Uh, it's locked up. So one of the goals I was, running it so it'd be quicker before we demonstrate. One of the goals is to not play a whole story, but an individual frame. In other words, one paragraph between the pictures. And Rich was able to Let me show that. Share. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. So yeah, I, uh, Wednesday I shared. And I've improved this Python script uh, to take language uh, version story frame and output, and so it'll uh, um, it'll cache things, everything from the language model that whisper uh, timestamp uh, uh, language model, and it puts it here. If you look over here on the top right, one of my IDEs now spinning like crazy, um, but it'll store this. Uh, and I just use a tiny one that seems to do well. I just need to get an idea of where words are in the transcript, where words are in the markdown. Um, we have an example here. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to show that. But <laughs> need to click that. Um, I took it. This is being very slow for some reason. Also, I don't know if it's Zoom effect. Did it just come on Zoom? Uh, let's just try it real quick. But I have an output directory here. I've already generated frame one of English. It's the demo effect plus the zoom effect at the same time. Oh, wow. it's just one in the screen. It doesn't even, it doesn't even show it's spinning there. It's spinning here. Okay. No, it doesn't. Spinning. Yeah, it doesn't show the spinner there. I can't take control. Well, keep spinning. I can't. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know, but let's see, Python, uh, get story. So I'm just going to show that I can even do French. Um, let's do it. So as we can see the help up there, I might take it off. That might even take a while to generate. But, um, if I do line French and the version that we have MP3 for is 4.3 and the only go to story 20, but if I do uh, story one, frame one, uh, Output will appear here. It's already got the model, but it has to download the MP3 file. So that's what it's, it's, uh, it's transcribing right now. So it's already downloaded it. This is what I've already done with English. And so it leaves the file. So it caches these things. So it'll be much faster the next time you do a frame. Uh, for French, it just got the story one and uh, MP3 and then the markdown uh, file here. Well, I don't know if it, you couldn't hear uh, Chris's mic, you probably won't hear this. 
but um, so I generated a French frame one, a story one frame one here, and I can load it to a player here. Yeah, I don't know if, yeah, I can't hear anything. We so don't hear anything up there. But uh, this is also a plugin uh, for the, the what to do is to make it so a player like this, which when you open an MP3, uh, has you can analyze this and separate it into frames altogether, so we can get this edited into frames, so it's easy to access. However, it'll work. You trust me that did the French as much as I don't know French. That I checked <laughs> if it got the French correctly. We need to speed it up. Hmm? We need to be quick. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. We're done. <laughs> okay, so the cool thing here that Rich did was we were taking an entire story one of OBS in audio, and um, Rich was able to automatically timestamp it for each frame um, by. Uh, analyzing from the text that we have of the of the OBS and aligning that or, or lining it up essentially through whisper um, so that it can automatically break that up and then we can seek to that particular frame or get that particular mp3 file um, but he was able to create a, a markdown file of these are the spots where each frame starts from an audio uh, recording Okay, uh, let's see. Someone just messaged me saying they needed to go next. Uh, Jay. Jay Shango, sir. Yes. Okay. Anjali will present first. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm representing one of the team from BCS. And let me share my screen. Okay. So this presentation is on Vajan Visual and a this biblical video generator. And these are the contents that will I will cover in this presentation. I will quickly share the details. So when it comes to the topic, text to video, the process in which a machine learning model will accept textual input and will generate corresponding visual representation. And thereby it transforms static written content into dynamic multimedia presentation. And uh, these models use advanced techniques uh, like ML, uh, machine learning, natural language processing, deep learning, computer vision, etc. And it understands the context and semantics in the text and then generate corresponding video sequence. And recently, this field is getting wide attention. And um, these are the few notable uh, models, uh, Sora from OpenAI, Imaging Video and Finaki from Google, and Make a Video from Meta. Uh, then uh, it has a wide applications in different domains. Uh, when it comes to Bible, uh, we can use it to in, uh, in, build interactive Bible app. Then it's useful for multi-model translation. Then it can be used for create animated Bible stories. Then visualization of Bible passages, illustration in religious stuff. Then uh, our objective was to build an application that automatically generate a video from text within the Bible domain. And most of these models are such uh, prompts in English. So uh, we will be giving the prompts in our own language, Indian languages. And uh, in BCS, we were working with text and uh, audio. So this image and video modalities are new to us. Uh, then when it comes to methodology, in the Learnathon week, we studied about uh, available open source text to video model. And these are the two uh, models we found uh, to be useful, model scope and uh, stable diffusion model. Uh, both these models can be fine-tuned. And uh, this um, stable diffusion model, text video to zero model, generates zero short video, uh, videos. And it gives better results compared to other ones uh, for Bible-specific prompts. 
And in method one, we try to fine tune model sports uh, text to uh, video model, and we built a text to video aligned data set and um, fine tuned it. But uh, the results were not matched good. Uh, we tried to increase the training steps on those. Then also it was not yielding much improvement. Uh, then we tried method two, fine tuning stable diffusion model. Uh, for that, we created text to image data set uh, using DALI 3 Excel model from Hagen Face. And uh, we fine tuned the uh, stable diffusion V15 model with this data set. And uh, we see a uh, significant improvement in the quality generated video quality. Then we retrained uh, it by increasing the hyperparameter, especially the training steps. Then increased the data set size. Initially, uh, we took uh, data from bookmark. Later, we added verses uh, uh, from Genesis uh, at and uh, one Samuel. And the final model, uh, we trained with a training step 5000. And the data set size is uh, 1502 images. And this generated, so refined tuned model will be added to the video pipeline for creating zero shot videos. So this is the system architecture. We have a text to video API, text to image API, and translate API. The input text will be translated to English language. And for that, we are using uh, NLLB 1.3B model. Then this translated English text will be passed to the fine-tuned model, and it will generate video. And we are doing some uh, enhancement over the generated video and the final output video can be downloaded. And in the case of fine tuning, um, we created data sets. For that, uh, we used uh, DALI uh, 3 model. Then this uh, data set will be used for fine tuning. And this fine tuned model is there in the pipeline. And I'm not going uh, much detail about this module. Um, uh, about model evaluation, uh, for evaluating the model, we created a test set of 20 prompts selected from across OT and ND books. Then uh, we manually evaluated the model performance by analyzing video generated by each version of the experiment of the model. Then analyze the video in terms of quality and relevance with the prompts given, inference time, etc. And we are uh, a rating is given to each inference in between one to five for quality and relevance with the prompt. Uh, then we took the uh, average rating. So the average inference time is 15 seconds, but uh, when it's through the API, uh, it's 40 seconds. Uh, so this includes uh, translation time plus model loading time and inference time. So these are the experiment results. Here, the first column shows number of images in the set, then training steps, then the last column, uh, the rate. So uh, you can see the significant uh, improvement with uh, increasing the steps and increasing the data set size. So the challenges we faced, uh, so we have GPU machine uh, that is of 24 GB, but we were a team of nine members. So the limit, it's has limited access and usage. Also, we were working with Google Collab that also has limited usage. And uh, the lack of required domain-specific resources, uh, especially the training data set. And uh, we are uh, first trying this uh, modality. Uh, then contribution. Uh, each member uh, actively uh, contributed to implement this tool. And these are the tools we used. And it's time for demo. Jason, I will present the demo. Okay. Shall I share the screen? Yes. Uh, this is our Swagger UI of uh, Visual SAP. And uh, going into the text to video endpoint. Uh, 
this endpoint we are having actually uh, two inputs first one is the text that is the prompt which you have to pass and the second input is the language which we have to choose uh, now going into the prompt first so here are the prompts which we have used if i'm using this prompt that is when jesus had come down from the hill a large crowd followed him so if i'm using this prompt here and uh, the language first will set it as english mm. yeah. and time uh, and And uh, once that is converted or generated into uh, the video, we can download that file here. So it will be downloaded as a file response of first API. And once click on that, so you can see the video that is generated uh, based on this particular prompt. So that's uh, that's how English is uh, converted into English prompt is converted into a video. And uh, we can do the same for uh, uh, Indian languages as well. Uh, as Anjali has already mentioned, uh, it's using the um, translation APIs here for that. So for instance, if you take this particular um, line, this particular prompt, so it's actually uh, the Hindi translation of this one, Noya and his family, and the link reaches under the arc and the flood begins. So this particular line can be chosen for, which is known as the prompt here. And when you do that, now we'll have to choose the language as well. Now it has to be Hindi. Hindi. And uh, and when this is done, uh, this particular Hindi text will be uh, translated first into English and uh, using that English prompt. Um, this English prompt will be passed to the model and the model will be generating the video based on that. And this will be uh, <clears throat> stored in the file and uh, returned, data returned as a streaming response of first API. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, this is the uh, depiction of the flood when Noah and his family enters the arc. Yeah, that's all about the video generation endpoint. So other endpoints are here, uh, which Anjali had already mentioned, the translation endpoint and the image generation endpoint, which we have used for uh, creating the data set. OK. Over to you, Anjali. Anjali will continue. Oops. Anjali, do you have anything else? Yeah, uh, this conclusion only. So uh, this text, text to video generation process is a required uh, high computational work and uh, uh, these models need to learn complex patterns and relationships between text and video content. So this uh, is computational heavy training needed and large scale data sets also needed. So our resources were limited. Yeah, that's it. Any questions for the video generations team generation team? Uh, well, I, I'm I was curious what kind of uh, uh, how do how do you train this kind of model? How uh, what kind of um, uh, data set did you use? Uh, it kind of looks like uh, OBS thing uh, video. Uh, am I wrong? It's a zero shot video. Uh, basically, this uh, model is a text to image model. And we can add this model into a video pipeline. So it will convert uh, that into a zero shot video. Yeah, we don't have much duration. You, 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 you told us that you fine-tuned fine the, the model. And so 
Uh, I was curious what kind of data do you use to uh, train that is, Yeah, this is text to image model. So we need to use a text to image parallel data set. So that we selected from Bible domain. So we have Bible versus the corresponding images. So Bible versus attached to images um, were what you used for training. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Do we want to? Who wants to? Zach, the Tone Rangers. Vipin, do you need to go early, uh, or are you just volunteering? Uh, it's fine. Yeah, Zach. Okay. Go. Zach. Thank you, Vipin. So <clears throat> I was working together, me and Philip. We did lose a member along the way, but me and Philip uh, stayed the course. So uh, thank you, Philip. And Philip, feel free to unmute and just jump in. Uh, it's okay. I'll take the privilege of moving the slides, but you you add what you want. Okay. So um, we we were inspired a lot by um, you know the theme of of multimodal community checking before this week. I didn't even know what multimodal meant, uh, and I didn't know what OBT meant. Uh, so this is this is very new to us. Uh, it was exciting to do the research. Um, our idea is to find a text to speech model or a, a a speech recognizer for low resource languages. So um, basically, that means for this project, we don't have access to language models or um, you know. Um, um, you know, existing data sets or something like that. So we're assuming kind of uh, in a low resource environment to be starting from scratch. And we did want the model to be what we called stable, which was uh, to be valuable. We would want multiple different speakers to be able to, um, you know, you can correlate the words. Oh, useful, 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 dangerous, dangerous, master. master. This is a quote this is by, a Christian I I muted you, Philip. Sorry. Sorry about that. So um, yeah. So uh, I guess we'll call this keyword checking prototype, or is this thing on? Right. Uh, talking to the computer. So uh, our method was uh, using Python. You know, it, it was a natural fit for this. Uh, it was a new tool for me. Uh, so I'm tagging several things here as new that uh, I'm speaking uh, as not an expert, but just, you know, hacking through it and learning. So take that, uh, take that, you know, with a, with a grain of salt. So, uh, so our approach was basically collect the data, clean the data, visualize the data, and then we built a little prototype. So uh, collecting the data, we had some dummy data with a male voice and a female voice. Uh, it was about five words. So a very small, you know, just a, a just a kind of a dummy data set. Uh, cleaning the data, I guess here's an analogy, is if you're familiar with machine vision, I think, again, this is the first time I had worked with audio, but I kind of understand how the machine vision algorithms work. And if you know what the algorithms are doing kind of behind the scenes, they, um, the machine, you know, has to basically clarify the input, right? So in, in, you know, edge detection or, you know, reduce it to black and white or something like that, we're, we're, uh, audio processing requires kind of a similar process. And then of course, it all has to go to the numbers, right? So uh, this was again, new to me. Philip has done this work uh, with earthquake science and it's, you know, um, a wiggly line is a wiggly line. So I think the signals are, are, you know, the tools are similar. So what are some of the steps to process the audio data, right? We have we have the, the, the training data, and then also we do this cleaning for the inputs to the system uh, for prediction, right? So subtract the noise floor, right? With any kind of microphone, there's gonna be some kind of ambient or background noise. Uh, normalize so that we want to uh, kind of um, uh, find a, a common average, right? Or a, a stationary um, stationary wiggly line, right? Before all the, between all the samples. And there's a technique called pre-emphasis, which is basically, if you think about the, the spectrum of sound, it's kind of lowering that down, or as an image example, it would be like reducing contrast. 
And then finally, we take the numbers to a scale called Mel scale. And again, this was new to me, but apparently this is a scale that uh, makes our audio features relevant to the sensitivity of the human ear. So that would make sense. If we want the machine to understand words, we want to correlate that to you know, a, a, a number that makes sense according to uh, you know, the, human, the human senses. So, okay, so now we've got some clean data so we can extract, uh, again, like I said, to the numbers, right? So get the signal to the numbers. So there is a technique, uh, and again, it was new to me, Philip, Philip is an expert in this, but the um, Mel spectrum frequency spectrum coefficients, is that right, Philip? But at any rate, it's those, it's those numbers that relate to the human ear and it's components uh, like PCA, like principal components, or like if you, uh, if you can think back to calculus, the Fourier series, how you can define those wiggly lines with a set of coefficient numbers it's just kind of a similar process. So those make up our features. Uh, and then we want to visualize the data, right? <clears throat> and this was early on in the process. It really gave us some encouragement that we are able to see what the machine is learning, right? So if you see on the left-hand side, these are two instances of the word God, you know, spoken word God from a male voice and a female voice. And you see that they, you know, the blobs look similar basically, right? And then over here is the word, uh, the phrase, in the beginning, again, a male voice and a female voice. And the point is, what was encouraging to us is, um, we won't go into detail on how to interpret the scales, but you could see the male voice and female voice match or look similar, right, in the two different, uh, in the same word. But across different words, we find that the data, you know, uh, the machine did learn some difference, right, is that the phrase, Male and female in the beginning look alike, but they're differentiated from the word God. And similar here, here's another, a few of our words, uh, wilderness, just visualizing it, you can tell it looks a little different from in the beginning. And then again, Jesus, right? The, the point is the machine is recognizing some difference between the words, but yet similarity between the speakers, which was important to us. Um, now, what you see here, so just to compare, this is a clean audio signal, and this is the audio coming from me sitting in my living room speaking into a laptop microphone. It's it's very noisy, right? So that was uh, you'll find later, or we'll we'll disclose later on uh, a major problem or a significant problem, uh, a challenge to overcome is this is this noise. Um, we started kind of lit review and off the shelf. There is a uh, Python library to do exactly what we needed to do. And the good news is it did find those words, you know, Jesus was detected as Jesus, God was detected as God. But you see here, uh, even by the numbers, I mean, we're talking a, a, a trillion of a, of, of a point difference between them. So if you rank them, you know, okay, th Jesus is very far from wilderness, but there's no clear, for us, there was no clear threshold to cut off what is considered um, a match or a not match, right? Yeah. So that's when we kind of rolled our own solution, right? Or, or um, took those kind of industry standards and, and tried to implement them. Uh, and here what we have, just to compare the graphs, definitely more clusters, right? That we could tell, hey, this was the match and everything else has kind of fallen away, right? Just to compare again here, very little contrast. Here, it's, it's a more clear distinction of what matched and what didn't so how can we use this or what's the application I, it was hard to visualize but i was i was we were very inspired by uh i think it was andy kellogg's demonstration of the translation group uh, working with the found object so i uh, i don't have experience with that kind of work but i imagine at some point the translators would speak their, you know, would, would, would um, voice their translation. And if you could collect samples, let's say if you have 10 translators in the room and you record each of those 10 translators, how similar are they, right? Do they, do they, did the group kind of standardize on a translation? Are there keywords that we find? Uh, is there some match between the translations or are they totally different? Uh, and that, that, you know, 
might be a helpful way to um, check the audio translation. Again, you know, we don't have a written text. We're going based on audio. So uh, a live demo. Uh, and this is, again, where we'll have the Zoom effect, I'm sure. So, um, so our target was something simple that could work on a phone, right? And the idea is we can select a word. Ideally, this would be like a verse, right? Um, we... Um, Birch pointed out early on, and we did find this, that it's very hard to split a sentence into individual words when you're working with audio. So that was a challenge for us. But if we're working, if we simplify the scope and go to the, just to the level of words, we can say something like, okay, beginning. And I'm gonna test it here by recording my voice. Beginning. And cross my fingers. And okay, so with an 88% match, it found the word beginning. Now. If I had said, oh, let me search God, oh, it says, no, that's not. But then look, also the similarity is still, a, it, it knew it wasn't God. I mean, it knew it wasn't in the beginning, but yet the system still, you know, um, um, it, it, it thinks it found a match, but it, it knows it wasn't in the beginning. So then I can try this. God. Okay. So again, 67, it thought that was God. Testing. Okay. So well, so it thought it was. It thought it said Jesus. So <laughs> um, that that's you know uh, some of the challenges. Testing. Yeah. Jesus. So um, and certain longer words are a challenge. Wilderness. Yeah, see, it's not, um, I, we did not have good luck with this word. Wilderness. So um, I don't know if it's the length of the word or the pauses, or I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but, but that was a challenge for us. So, so what we found was, uh, just to kind of summarize uh, what we found in the results, we do have some practical limitations. So the tools that we had to use, uh, it did require internet access, right? That we weren't able to port the tools into JavaScript. So we can't do it client side. It does require an API, which means you have to be online. Um, I wish I wish I had uh, I wish I had seen Alexander or the the text tree project before and and Bruce's project before or the the Orlando group that uh, we were not able to get to a wave file on the client. So we have to, again, we're on the server, translate it to a WAV file. The, the, the APIs in the browser we were using and the serve and the, the, the analytics tools use different audio formats. So that was a challenge for us. Uh, and then here's the real, the real challenges. Um, so again, this is a supervised method that in order for this to make sense, you would have to tag some of the data. Uh, the inputs from the field were very noisy and that affected both you know, both kind of ways to measure the accuracy of the system. We got a lot of false positives and we did have some problem identifying the correct matches, uh, as you saw, you know, in, in some of those words. Um, if, and a, a couple of solutions here, if we found some way, like maybe using an audio editor, like a text tree group showed, maybe we can clean up these signals, um, you know, as we record them, uh, or we could just gather more data. And that's really where the machine learning algorithms uh, have a benefit, where noise like this, when I'm talking into my microphone, the machine, al the machine learning algorithms can adjust for that, right? And, and it's kind of like how the machine vision algorithms can learn to recognize an object from different angles. So too, um, perhaps the machine learning audio, audio uh, transcribers can learn how to recognize uh, a noisy channel voice signal. Uh, much like the way, you know, you train your iPhone by moving it at different angles. That's, that's the benefit that a machine learning algorithm has that, that these, you know, these, um, you know, um, I guess computational or whatever the word is, don't. So, uh, so it's kind of like this, right? That you see, I don't know if you can see the phrase here, but Bing 
famously tagged this owl as a pineapple. So that's, I think that's the state that we're in sometimes now. So, um, uh, and it, it, towards that solution of, of, of making the predictions more accurate, again, thinking about that application of keyword checking, I imagine something like the way we do, or the way Unfolding Word, I know like starts with Titus, right? And then you can move to another book. As you, as you move to more and more, as you add more and more books, you know, as, or sorry, as the translation progresses through more and more books, your, your number of audio samples would, would increase. And maybe if, if there was some way to automatically tag those or relate it to the, to the verse or something like that, that, um, that would help us filter the predictions more. So, um, yeah, so um, I, I guess the conclusion, in order for this to really be useful, there's some more, you know, some more fine tuning, some more um, um, improvements that need to be done. So thank you so much, everyone, for letting us present. If you have any questions, we're happy to ask, answer. <laughs> Thank you, Zach and, and Philip, for really fully embracing the um, the posture of this this hackathon with the multimodal and the um, the set audio and just the experimental nature of of what you attempted to do. Really, really very interesting. Really cool. Thank you. Okay, Vipin. Hello, hello everyone. So here I'm sharing my screen. Yes. So we are the one of the team from Bridge Connect Solution. And we worked on audio recorder extension for VS Code. And we were uh, actually it was our first try and it was completely an RNT process for all of us. Uh, for the entire team, uh, we are working uh, working on the extension, and uh, uh, we did come with a few of the features inside. That is, one is uh, it's a scripture burrito based uh, project where you can create a burrito based project and you can open a burrito based project and work on it. And it has a basic audio recording and playback functionality currently. And uh, uh, there is a creation mode where the project can be created and exported and open already an existing burrito based project and an audio preview where the waveforms can be seen and can be moved the waves can be i mean the clicks can be moved here and there and the play button can be played along with it and we use a usfm grammar uh, that's an in-house tool uh, for a reference viewer so if someone has any uh, any usfm file for recording they can actually import it and uh, uh, this using yourself and grammar we have uh, converted it passed it to a, a reference viewer where we can look into that text and we can record and uh, the powerful function is is an oral bible translation where if you doesn't have it uh, text still you can translate uh, with this tool and uh, next is uh, i would like to show the wireframe from where we started so this was the initial wireframe that we made and uh, this was our end goal that, uh, okay, we had this picture in our mind and we drew it and uh, we shared with the entire team and our team did focus to work on this. And finally, we come up with something from here to this. So this is the place, this is the current UI, how it looks uh, and uh, the, the creation and everything. So I would like to go for demo next. So here. Okay, so currently for creation, we doesn't have any uh, UI that is yet to be made, uh, but we have a command. So when we use this command, uh, start a new audio project. So we click on it. So it asks for what's your, what the name of the project. So I just put a demo on the username, maybe scribe. And uh, next is it, it creates its own abbreviation of the project that is for demo D. So we'll put D1 or D itself. Let's select a source language, uh, maybe English and uh, Malayalam for target language. And uh, this is the scope of the Bible. 
that is you can either select the full bible to record or old testament or new testament i'll just select a new testament because it has lower books so and the versification scheme that usually we work on the eng that is the normal versification scheme and when you do it so here it is so it it has created the project and you can see there is a metadata that is the burrito file and this has a audio uh, uh audio directory that's been created so we can look into the back end how it looks uh okay so here everything has been created with the metadata and things so now we'll come back and we'll check the metadata and everything everything is here uh, the metadata has been created project name username uh, and everything with uh, the current scope that is new testament matthew to revolution and uh, ingredients is empty right now so let us start recording when we jump into record uh, this here it is matthew chapter one okay here it is chapter one that's been loaded so this chapter intro, this been another request from the field. Uh, they need to record the intro. For that reason, I have made this. I mean, the entire team has made this. And uh, when you click on this, there is a record button. Uh, when you click, it starts recording. So it's blinking right now. When you stop it, uh, the recording has been done. So the wave waveforms are here. And uh, when you try to play this, it starts recording. So it's blinking right now. So it's recording, it's recording all of the things. Uh, and, uh, oh, okay, so this is without the text. I already have an, another project which has a text. So I can show how, if you have an, another Barito project, how can you open it? So we'll go to an, another project, which already has a Barito inside. So here, in, here it is. Matthew. Yeah, so here it is with the data. This is all of the data that's been taken uh, using USF and Grammar. We have passed it. So here it is with, uh, there are three audios that's already been recorded. So I would try to record one more here. Is This is uh, Matthew chapter one introduction. So here it is and the the interesting facts here here it is uh, whenever when whenever we record something uh, at the same time it's it's gonna update on the metadata that's on the metadata JSON file so when you check here here it is the ingredients that's been updated with all of these things so I will, so currently this is this is the introduction wow. chapter one verse three verse four verse two uh, and side by side I can try to record another verse to check whether it's working or not. Verse five, uh, uh, recording verse five for the testing. So here it is, so verse five, it's at the, at the same time it generated uh, the burrito and with all the things, it has a size, sizes in bytes and we have like hashed it and all of the things have been here. Uh, we have generated a wave file with this. Okay, the delete also works when you delete uh it removes from the ingredients i mean this uh, removes from the burrito file and also it works on the ui side too so uh okay this is the basic functionality of this and then we have an export functionality that is currently only a worst level export we can export it to maybe we will try to export at some other place okay here there is okay so I exported it. We'll check whether it's available or not. Yeah, testing audio is been is here. And another another good thing about this is if you try to record this again and you export it again on the same place. Okay, I will try to record the five recorded. And if I try to export it, a worst level export, and again on the same location. Uh, Uh, it will ask me, okay, there is already an folder that exists. Do you want to overwrite or not? If I do I overwrite, it will update with the latest functionality. Okay, currently, yeah, 
it will update it with the latest one. Uh, it was just a prompt that there is already a folder that's available. So that's it. Uh, that's how the audio recording functionality works. And this is the first uh, extension that we have built for the audio. And there are more features that is coming up. Uh, and uh, is there any questions for this? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure because uh, uh, Bruce and others saying like the recorder was not working. We also came across that dead end where the web view was not allowing us to record it. But uh, finally, we found some some solutions that uh, we, we went through here and there. Uh, at last day, we thought, OK, it's not possible. We will leave it. We won't work further. Uh, but uh, we used some of, uh, OK, instead of trying to use in the front end, we tried to do it in the back end. So mm -hmm. that's how it worked. Okay. Well, I expect uh, Monday morning when we have the UW and BCS meeting, they're going to have many questions for you. <laughs> they want to know how you accomplish this. Um, uh, but um, yeah, now I'm wondering, are, are you starting VS Code with permissions from the command line? But we can talk about this offline, not today. Any yeah. other questions for Vipin? Okay, Benz. Uh, thank you. Can you stop sharing, Vipin? Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Hey, thanks, Vipin, for making the chapter intro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there are more features that is coming up. I thought of, okay, anyway, you got, there is only limited time we have. Yeah, more mm -hmm. future enhancement will be there. We have a couple of points around uh, nine, 10 points are there. Yeah. Thank you. I okay. Think... Let me share my screen. And yeah. Okay. This is our final product. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, room to room for improvement. But uh, this is uh, a great uh, teamwork. We could learn a lot, lot of the things in, from uh, Learnathon. Then we could implement all those things, whatever we have learned. Uh, so uh, this is, we call it Open Bible Stories AI Validator. Uh, this is a very simple tool, but very powerful. Uh, why I say so, uh, if a QA content checker, if he takes a lot of time to check the content and before publishing it, this will really assist them to check the first round of checking. So that is what we are planning to do here. So uh this is okay so uh, let me just do a demo then later part of the presentation raven will uh, show the frameworks how the entire structure works behind so first you have to take a valid md file okay one more uh, uh feature we wanted to add this is we wanted to extend it to usfm checking also first uh, now we are doing only for md so you have to just upload a md file i have a lot of md files here so I can just go with uh, French for the beginning. So this is the way it uploads. Then you have to choose your uh, translation, which language you wanted to translate and you wanted to uh, find the uh, entire uh, validation. You just translate it. Once it is translated, then you can just validate it. So when you hit the validation button, it will just tell you how correct the uh, translation is and if is there any mismatch between the paras. So if you find any alarming sign, this warning sign, you can just hover over it and it will tell you what, why it is failing. So uh, then you can just, if it is a swap, it will give you more detail about it. If it is correct, it will not give you any uh, details, but it will give you the score. Here also, you can just check all your uh, data. This is translated from English and translated to French, so you can just use it. So anybody who have uh, who is doing the OBS translation or anybody wanted to check their uh, translated OBS, they can use this tool. So how it is working? Uh, first, you have to uh, this source text is kept uh, in the app itself. So always it will be translating to uh, from English to the target language, whatever you wanted to do. So here, when you upload something, this is the problem we have found initially. So that is the main reason 
uh, we wanted to build this app. Uh, so first I'll just let me go to the OBS folder. It's in the, the, the 13, this is the main problem we have found initially. So this will loads up like this. Now, what we are doing at the back, uh, we are converting, this is the uploaded text, the MD file, whatever I have uploaded, this is the uploaded text. And now we are machine translating. That is where we are just giving the name as Hindi. Choose the language. And now we are prompting the uh, computer to process the entire data uh, for the machine translation from English. So when we hit the translate, it will give you the English tra Hindi translation from English. Now, uh, with the help of Blue Score, we are comparing these two texts, the uploaded Hindi data and the machine translated Hindi data. So now when we hit the validate, it will immediately give you where it is right and where it is wrong. So in this story, earlier we had a problem of uh, swap because this seven story, if somebody who can read Hindi, they can understand this, the seven and the 10 story was swapped. So some a translation, uh, not, this is not a translation error. This is while they were compiling the uh, data, it got swapped. So here it is giving the right information. So when it is swapped, then you can just hover over it. It will check the entire process and it will give you the suggestion also, which can be, which uh, story can, can be matching more. So here it is saying the 10th with a score of 0 0.6035. So the same way, if you go to the 10th story, it will tell you which story got swapped. So this is the actual problem we had. So based on this issue only, we started thinking of building this app. So this is the front end uh, part of it. Uh, also, I like to uh, say that uh, this results are comparing uh, from uh, uh, Blue Score. So that is comparing this Hindi text to the machine translated text. Now, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. Later, Raven will show the architecture and how it is functioning in a, a code base. This looks very good, very helpful. Thanks. Raven, would you like to share screen? On? to uh, uh, this called OC code validator. We call it OBS PI validator. So, uh, Raven, you're a little soft. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was saying we pushed all our code to the uh, BridgeCon OC with 24 OBS validator repo. So, there's two apps here. So, the README uh, it tells you the problem statement which Ben's told and the workflow, how to go about it. There's a API service and a web service. So they both have like uh, readme links, which is inside these folders. So uh, they tell you how to set up. So this one is based on Python. Right? It requires a lot of space. We are running the machine transfers on, on our local disk, and it requires some RAM and a good internet connection to download that all that stuff. Uh, the UI is quite straightforward. It uses a React and a Vite, and it gives you the steps to install it. Um, I think the, the wireframe, I think uh, already, I think we had shown that in the Tuesday demo. So we followed it. I think Ben's given the demo for that. And uh, so this is the architecture, I think. So we had, uh, basically, uh, the React V app is on the, like, running on the local machine. So you, like, the, you upload the MD file and uh, it sends it to the Python app API. So it's running a fast API uh, server. Uh, similar to what Jay Shakar shared, right? that's the documentation which it generates automatically. And it's using a torch AI thing and using a pre-built uh, NLB from Meta, the 1.3 model. And uh, so once you upload it, it uh, saves it in your database. 
and we're using a uh, SQL light because it's just a, a sort of a POC and it has some English text like uh, Ben said and once you uh, send it, it will show the translated text. So it will catch it here. And uh, the, the problem is catching it because it takes nearly five minutes to uh, translate uh, one story. So around 16 paras, it will take about five minutes uh, on our local machines. We have like i5, 16 GB. Uh, if you have a GPU and you uh, tweak the torch, they have different setups. GPUs, you could get it faster. But on our local setups, we were uh, waiting for five minutes. So we'll cache them. Uh, so what Ben showed you is the cached version. It comes within a second from the database. And uh, so, so they'll fetch it. And uh, if it is uh, matching this, the length is same and everything is same, it will show it in the UI. And then here it runs a validate. Validate it, we are using a NLTK a blue score kit. It's also inbuilt. So we're just putting things together. So there's not much R&D here, yeah, but we had a problem space and we took multiple things and put them together. Uh, so this will validate it first with the same para, para one with one. If it fails, it will take all the paras and see which matches the best one and give you a recommendation and give it in the UI. And uh, also we started uh, the last day we thought of, uh, we playing with playwright automation test. So Jessney uh, from our team, she uh, is good at that. So she wrote a few tests just to test out the three buttons on the top. And uh, yeah, that's our team, I think. So front end we had Vinita, Seema, Disney, Job and Ben. Uh, documentation for the readme is Job did. And Disney did the automation. Back end we had Anu, Liju, Ashish and me. So yeah, that's our. So uh, it's all in the GitHub repo, like I mentioned. So, there. Very good, very good. Any questions for the OBS validation? Yeah, I like to mention two more names because mm -hmm. they were not part of our team, but external resources, they're really helpful. Shimil and Anjali, they tirelessly, they really helped us. In the mm -hmm. AI part, we had a lot of difficulty so, so they really helped us and the server team also we need to appreciate them for their cooperation yeah uh, wonderful yeah, i'd like to like mention like uh, earlier we were actually trying to use their uh, button engine backend but uh we were nine of us all of us were going into tinker and going and doing stuff there so after day two we thought we make our own backend and not overload that tinker machine mm. so uh, we made our own backend and uh anjali helped us a lot with that so excellent pointed us towards an LLB limitation is it only supports currently 200 uh, models. So that we can probably find better models which have more. So this has only uh, this many uh, languages currently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've looked at that model. Okay. Um, can I just quickly, uh, I mean, French on the screen, very happy about this. If it was helpful, uh, we would be happy to do some manual evaluation of the machine translations. If you would send us that without the reference translation, we could kind of score them, and maybe you could compare that with the scores you're getting from Blue and see what that looks like. If you want to do that, you can find me on Discord. Okay, I think that was a yes from Reva um, and Ben's. Thank you, Mark, for that offer. Okay, uh, our first on-location uh, hackathon team in Colombia, uh, Abel, if you want to uh, present. Yes, thank you, Bert. Um, Thank you, everyone. Okay, so I'll leave you with Elias. He's the one that's gonna do the oh, presentation. Great. Let me share the screen. Hi, good morning, guys. Um, oh, nice. Is that... I, I just copy it. Uh -huh. see, see. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Then I put my hands on the screen. Yes. Let me see now. Hey. Yes. 
Okay, so our goal this hackathon was to make uh, to develop an application for reading the open Bible stories that works offline. And um, also, the goal for this hackathon was to consolidate the new Idiomas Puentes tools development team because mm -hmm. before this, it was only three of us, but now we are like nine. So it's it's uh, really, really nice for us, and we are thankful. Yeah. Uh, our application lifecycle, uh, it bases like the application searches for Bible stories on the device. And if it finds them, uh, it searches. It searches if there's a new version, any and it installs the new version. If it doesn't find Bible stories, it tries to download them. And the app displays the Bible stories and allows the user to browse through them. Um, our components are the OBS loader, which loads the OBS from the file system or from the remote server, and the frame render which renders a frame of the OBS, very basic. Mm -hmm. And the frame navigation, which allows the user to navigate one frame at a time. And the story navigation, which allows the user to navigate between stories. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was a very basic project. And now I was gonna show you the application. Yeah, now I have the pleasure to <laughs> just show the application, let me, check here okay so we did have a challenge there is a dependency that is breaking the build process for the apk file the dot apk file so but um which screen let me show. oh sorry okay so are you able to see the yes device here yeah. Yes. Okay, so this is the Android emulator that we have here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me check if I can show you. No. Okay, so basically this is the application. It only loads the OBS. Um, so when it opens, it tries to check if there is an OBS um, folder inside the device in the file system. If there is none, it tries to download it. Um, um, but if there is one, it tries to get, if there is internet, it will try to update the, the version to the latest one. And here it is, it is working. This is for the idiom, uh, language called Sanema. It's an ethnic group here in, well, there in Venezuela. And, uh, yeah, it is, it's a, it's a very basic application. There were kind of like nine persons involved in this. But most of them didn't know any any React or any JavaScript even, so it was a, a big challenge this week to just uh, teach the team uh, about React and JavaScript and handle handle all of these of creating a new application without knowing all of that. So, yeah, mm. it was great. The person who was in charge of building the global state of the application was Elias. He did a great work with that. But we also had someone that was in charge of doing all of the back with the logic stuff about getting the stories from the file system and all that. And that person was not familiar with JavaScript. He, but he <laughs> did have a lot of a lot of experience with Java, and he did a great work, and it is working now. So yeah, that Excellent. is it. Okay, so that's all. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, any everyone. Questions? Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Um. <laughs> I am so impressed, I'm with, so impressed um, with all the projects that uh, have been shown today and really all the effort and work that you've done this week. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's just... Uh, Really, my heart is just full of joy seeing seeing all of you working together, doing this, uh, making this effort and coming together and working as teams. Really, really appreciate it. Let me give you just a few instructions. Um, Follow-up steps after this meeting, post links to your code 
uh, on Discord, post links to your presentation as well. Um, I'm going to post this, this recording of this meeting in just a few hours. And then on Monday, we'll have a page that gives you links to everything from the Learnathon and the Hackathon. Of course, the, the Google Drive folder is already posted on the Discord channel, so you can always go there and try to navigate and figure out what's what. But um, we'll try to make that a little more organized uh, for you on Monday. Um, so let's close in prayer. Uh, actually, Abel, would you close us in prayer and thank God for all these developers, all this work that's been done this week? Sure, sure I can. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you did this week. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for all of the amazing projects that were shown today. Uh, thank you for the impact that the, these projects will have in um, people from every everywhere in the world having your your word in their in their hearts. Or mm -hmm. thank you, Father, for the knowledge that you have given all of my brothers, Lord, and thank you for their um, their passion for doing the work that you have uh, given to them. Thank you, Lord. I, I ask that everyone uh, that is traveling and everyone that is not at home, that they have a safe travel home, back home, Lord. Also for us that are um, far from our homes, that we can have a safe trip as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you for this. This has been really, really great. Really appreciate it. God bless you. Bye, guys. Good work.